The Diseases of Attitude. It's never that pleasant to talk about the negative, but we got to talk about it because life is part negative. These attitude diseases are like weeds that grow in the garden. It's a normal part of life. Here's a good phrase to note. Negative is normal. It's not successful, but it's normal. It's part of life. And here's the next key, in my opinion. You must learn to handle the negative. Don't ignore it, handle it. Now, I know some people teach the other way. And listen to them, and listen to me, and then make up your own mind, right? Don't be a follower, be a student. But I say you've got to handle the negative. You don't have to live in it. You don't have to dwell on it, but you do have to handle it, my opinion. I know some people teach, just turn your head real quick and say, there's no weeds, there's no weeds, there's no weeds. They'll take your garden. <laughs> so you've got to handle the negative. Here's what part of it is. It's called the great war between good and evil. Mr. Reynolds and I are working on a new book this year called The Great War Between Good and Evil. And there is a war on. The minute you were born, you got involved in the war between good and evil, between darkness and light, between negative and positive, between evil and good, between tyranny and democracy, between weeds and human activity. I mean, the war is on. If democracy sleeps, guess who never sleeps? Tyranny. In the absence of light, guess what's automatic? Darkness. If good does not arouse itself and become active, guess what moves in? Evil. It's a war, a mental war, a physical war, a financial war between enterprise and ease, between accomplishment and failure. It's a war. That's why there's an Old Testament phrase that gives the best advice for human activity when it says, six days labor, one day rest. Now, I'm sure we've taken that to mean, don't work all seven days, take one off. Here's what it also means, only take one off. <laughs> or you're liable to lose the war. Now, we've got it down to five and two, and maybe that's not too dangerous, I don't know. If God would have thought of five and two, he might have made it five and two, I don't know. You can't think of everything. But here's what it does mean. Enterprise is better than ease. If you rest too long, the jungle overtakes the village. Now, here's the good news about the war between good and evil. Evil is no match for good, but good must be active. Weeds are no match for human activity, but if you stand still, how far in will they come? All the way. They'll grow right up around your shoes. But if you get busy, how far back can you take them? As far as you wish. They're no match, but you must be active. That's why the six and one. Make sure you're not losing the war by taking off too much. Guess what the average years are after retirement? Six. Six. Which means don't retire. <laughs> Your chances are too slim. Okay. The war between good and evil, the weeds. You got to make sure you recognize the negative, handle it, deal with it, and then go on. Let's make a list of the diseases of attitude that can wreck all your chances to do well. One of the words that destroys everything is called neglect. Neglect. And I found this out. A week of neglect could cost you a year of repair. It isn't worth it. So what to be on the lookout for? Here's the list. If you were making it, you'd have the same list I've got. Right? We're not covering anything new tonight. This is a reminding session, not a teaching session. But it doesn't hurt to go over it again. Here's the list. Attitude diseases. 
Number one is indifference. The shrug of the shoulder. The guy's not even concerned. He's just drifting. This is called the mild approach to life. A disease known as mildness. The guy says, well, I can't see getting all that worked up. Well, to be any kind of winner, you got to get worked up. There's one problem with drift. You cannot drift to the top of the mountain. And the good Lord said in the closing chapters of the Bible, here's the best way to live, one way or the other. That's best. Hot or what's next best? Cold is next best to hot. Not the half-baked middle, lukewarm, not too hot, not too cold. What a sad way to live. I think what it means is pick a direction and go with everything you've got. Just pick one and go. Somebody says, yeah, but what if it's the wrong direction? You'll find out quicker. <laughs> it won't take you 25 years to wake up and say, oh no, I've been walking the wrong road. I told my staff the other day, next best to prosperity is adversity. If one doesn't get you, pray for the other. We all do better from one of two reasons, inspiration or desperation. And I don't wish anything bad on you tonight, but if you're not inspired, I hope a wagon comes down your rut. <laughs> Whatever it takes to get you to try harder, read more, set your goals, and go for it. Somebody asked me one time, what quality would I pick if I wanted to work with somebody? And you know what I picked first, number one? Strong feeling. Please, number one, give me somebody that feels strong. About most anything, I don't even care. Just so they believe it even if they disagree with me. Wonderful, just so they disagree vigorously. I'm not saying it's easy to win those kind of people to your point of view, but I'd rather do that than to try to resurrect people from the dead. Pump them up every month, pump them up, pump them up. I pass. The good Lord needs a leader for the early Christians. Remember the early days of the Christians? Not like today. If you were to stand up in the early days and say, I'm a Christian, cut off your head, toss you and your wife in jail, let you rot. I mean, those were ugly days. Being a Christian back then was not called socially acceptable. They didn't have 125,000 in the Los Angeles Coliseum to hear Billy Graham on a Sunday afternoon. Not back in those days. Back in those days when the Christians got in the Colosseum, it was a different story, right? I mean, the word was, stay out of the Colosseum, especially on Sunday. Last Sunday it was Lions 33, Christians nothing. See, those were mean, tough, struggle days for the Christians. Now, when the days are mean and tough and struggling, you got to have some kind of leader. Do you know who the good Lord picked for the leader when the days were mean and ugly? Saul from Tarsus. That's who he picked, Saul. I'll tell you what, I would have picked him. You would have picked him. Anybody would have picked Saul. Saul was one of those incredible guys. Once he got into something, look out. Everybody in the community knew what Saul was in. Because whatever he joined, he'd flip all the switches, open up all the dials, turn on all the faucets and go like mad. He was known as all out Saul. I mean, he was something else. Now, at first, it wasn't working out well. Saul hated Christians, which makes a poor leader, right? I mean, that won't work. <laughs> Saul got this bug somewhere about the Christians. He got to hating Christians. And he hated them so bad, every time somebody would say Christian, he'd fly into a rage. And I guess he decided one life, or one day, it was his mission in life to get rid of all the Christians. He was Saul anyhow, could do most anything he wanted to. So he got in these letters of authority to go around to the various communities and hunt down the Christians. They said, do whatever you want to with them, Saul. They're unpopular anyhow. Drag them in the streets, whip them, stone them, torture them, kill them. You mentioned the name Saul from Tarsus to the early Christians. I'll tell you what they would do. 
They would run, hide, lock the doors, leave town, dive underground. I've been in the catacombs of Rome where they hid. He was mean. I mean, terribly mean. But remember the story? One day Saul's making it for Damascus. Heard about some new Christians, flies into a rage, takes off for Damascus. And the story said he was angry. There's a little sentence in the story that says, on his way to Damascus, he was breathing out threatenings and slaughter, which meant he felt rather strong about the idea, right? <laughs> That's strong. That's strong. But on this journey, right, according to the story, as Saul was making his way to Damascus, the good Lord looks down out of heaven and says, there's my man, Saul. He's got to be something else. And according to the story, this great light shines out of heaven, knocks him flat, right off his horse, grinds his face in the dirt, and blinds him for three days. The good Lord using recruiting tools we can't use, but <laughs> <laughs> when you're Lord, right? <laughs> to make a long story short, Saul from Tarsus becomes converted to Christianity. He becomes Paul the great leader, the apostle. And without a doubt, the good Lord got him a dandy. One, he didn't have to pump up every month. <laughs> In one of his later writings, he said, the things I once hated, I now love. The things I once loved, I now hate. See, that's strong. Here's the key to the good life. Learn to put everything you've got into everything you do. Whatever you are doing, pour it on. It will quickly open up into opportunity or quickly di disclose to you that you ought to be doing something else. The delusion is, if I had a better job, I'd really pour it on. See, that's delusion. Wherever you are, pour it on. Don't give somebody half a job for a day's pay. Pour it on. See, that'll help change your life. Get rid of this disease. Here's the next attitude disease, indecision. Mental paralysis. The guy can't make up his mind and it becomes a disease. Pretty soon he knows he's got it. The guy says, well, I know I'm on the fence. But he says, what if I get off on the wrong side? Listen, after a while it doesn't matter. Just get off. <laughs> Any side will do. A life full of adventure is a life full of many decisions. The ones that turn out to be wrong give you better experience to make better decisions. So don't see how many decisions you can get out of, see how many you can get into. That's where the adventure is. So shake off this disease, indecision. The next one is doubt. Doubt's like a plague. And one of the worst is self-doubt. There are many, but that's one of the worst. The guy doubts himself. Doubts if it'll last that long for him. Doubts if he can do that well. Doubts if he can make that much. Doubts if he can accomplish all that. A chronic, excellent self-doubter. You can imagine what damage that does to your future. So here's the key. Turn this coin over and become a believer. And there's many things to believe in. One of the majors is yourself. The understanding of self-worth is the beginning of progress. Now, if those three don't get you, this one will. Worry. That's a devastating disease. Worry. Worry causes health problems, social problems, personal problems, family problems. It's devastating. Worry long enough, it'll drop you to your knees. Could reduce you to begging. I know how bad this one is. I used to have it bad. I used to be known as a super worrier. Not a super warrior. No super warrior. My family wished I'd have been a warrior. I got those years to make up for. But I'll tell you what. My advice to you is do what I finally did on worry. Give it up. Who needs it? I'm not saying it's easy. I'm saying it's worth it. It took me almost one year to kick the worry habit, and it was not an easy year. It was one of the toughest years I ever spent, but I finally got that monkey off my back. And I discovered you could live the most incredible life free of worry. Not free of challenge, not free of difficulty, free of worry. I learned how to do it, and you can. 
Here's the next attitude disease. Over caution. Some people never will have much. They're too cautious. Now you can also be too reckless, but you can also be too cautious. This is called the timid approach to life. And my caution was always the risk. Risk used to drive me right up the wall. I used to say, what if this happens? It's called the language of the poor. What if this happens? And on top of that, if this was to happen, look at the fix I'd be in. I better not try. I could always ace myself out. Then I'll tell you what changed my whole life when I finally discovered it's all risky. The minute you were born, it got risky. If you think trying is risky, wait till they hand you the bill for not trying. If you think investing is risky, wait till you get the tab for not investing. See, it's all risky. Getting married is risky. Having children is risky. Going into business is risky. Investing your money is risky. It's all risky. I'll tell you how risky life is. You're not going to get out alive. <laughs> that's risky. The Englishman says, well, if that's the way it's going to work out, let's give it a go. Right. That's what it's for. Give it a go. Somebody says, yeah, but I'm looking for safety and security. Fine, then huddle in a corner. We'll cover you with a sheet, bring you three meals a day. And we'll protect you, feed you, look after you, care for you. We won't let anything happen to you. And you'll probably live to be 100. The guy said, well, yeah, I'd live to be 100. But what a way to live. Right. What a way to live safe and secure. Don't ask for security. Ask for adventure. Better to live 30 years full of adventure than 100 years safe in the corner. And see, it's not important how long you live. What's important is how you live. Here's the next attitude disease. We're almost through with this motley list. In fact, we're almost through. Hang on. The next one is pessimism. Pessimism, the deadly disease of always looking on the bad side, the problem side, the difficult side, checking all the reasons why it can't be done. The poor pessimist leads an ugly life. He doesn't try to figure out what's right. He tries to figure out what's wrong. He doesn't look for virtue. He looks for faults. And when he finds them, he's delighted. How ugly. This is the poor guy looks through the window, doesn't see the sunset. He sees the specks on the window. <laughs> and this is the poor guy, right, who rushes up, takes such leave of his senses. This guy rushes up and he says, I've got five good reasons why it won't work. He's so dumb, he doesn't know. All he needs one. He's got five. <laughs> To the pessimist, the glass is always half empty. To the optimist, the glass is half full. Why would the same measure affect people two different ways? Answer, it all depends on how you look at it. Our lives are mostly affected by the way we think things are, not the way they are. The way we think they are affects us most. There's a subject we don't have time to get into tonight called better thinking habits. One of the major things Shove taught me when I met him, he said, poor thinking habits keeps most people poor. Not poor working habits. Most people work hard, but they don't think hard. And Shove taught me that the mind is like a factory, a mental factory. And whatever you think about all day long pours ingredients into this mental factory. And that's what builds the economic, social, financial fabric of your life. He quoted me a Bible phrase that says, as you think, so you become. How awesome. When he talked about poor thinking habits, he had me. I used to start the day reading the morning newspaper. 
I mean, you can believe that or not. I'd get a cup of coffee and read the paper. I'd load up on wars and riots and murders and stabbings and killings and bank robberies and muggings and car wrecks and tragedies. I'd even read the back pages. I seem to like that stuff for some weird reason. I'd load up on all that and then I'd start the day. You can imagine the kind of days I used to have. You walk around on your financial knees. They call you economic peewee. <laughs> the guy says, I want to be a great leader. Wonderful. The first thing we do is follow him to his house. When we get there, we walk in and check his library. Number one. Somebody says, well, why check his library? The reason is because what a man reads pours massive ingredients into his mental factory and the fabric of his life is built from those ingredients. You would not believe what some people have got in their house to read. You would not believe. One of the best dressed up words I know for a lot of it is trash. Can you imagine dumping a barrel of trash into this mental factory every day and coming out with a rich, dynamic, positive life? It can't be done. You might as well try making a cake with cement. The kids back in Danbury, Connecticut, high school, they're asking me questions one day. I'm talking to the kids. Kids got good questions these days. One of them said to me, Mr. Rohn, how do you build the good life? I said, it's simple. It's not easy, but it's simple. Here's how you build anything. Select the right ingredients, keep out the wrong ingredients, and it starts with thought. Everything starts with thought. So you must be wise and careful what you think about because that starts everything. You got to be wise and careful. I asked the kids, what would happen if somebody dropped sugar in my coffee? They said, well, you'd be okay. I said, what if somebody dropped strychnine in my coffee? They said, well, you'd be dead. I said, correct. Lesson one, life is both sugar and strychnine. You got to be careful. I said, what if my worst enemy drops in the sugar? They said, will you be okay? I said, what if my best friend, even by accident, drops in the strychnine? They said, well, you'd be dead. I said, correct. Lesson two, watch your coffee. <laughs> you gotta be careful. See, it doesn't matter who hands you the bad stuff. It doesn't matter where you get the bad stuff. It'll still do its damage on your bank account wherever you get it. Mr. Shof gave me one of the greatest phrases when I first met him when he said, Jim, every day stand guard at the door of your mind. How important. Stand guard at the door of your mind. And you decide what goes into your mental factory. Don't let anybody just dump anything they want to in your mental factory because you've got to live with the results. Okay, here's the last disease and we're through with this list. In fact, we're almost through. Hang on. The last subject is very brief. The last disease, but this one is deadly. Engage in this one, indulge in it even slightly and you might as well forget the future because it's going to forget you. Complaining, crying, whining, griping, a Bible word called murmuring. See, that'll ace your future. Spend five minutes complaining and you have wasted five. And you may have begun what's known as economic cancer of the bone. Surely they will soon haul you off into a financial desert and there let you choke on the dust of your own regret. I hope I said that well, so you won't forget. It's a deadly disease. If you don't think it's bad, ask the children of Israel of Old Testament fame. Typical of us all, their story just happened to get in the book. Story says, 
children of Israel were slaves. God performed a series of dazzling miracles and got them out. And now they're heading for the promised land. Remember the story? Heading for the promised land. Tragedy of the story? They never got there. Reason. From day one, they started to complain. They griped about the water. They griped about the weather. They whined and cried and griped about the food. They griped about the leadership. They whined and cried because it was too far, too cold, too hot, too difficult, too miserable. I mean, they whined and, whined and cried for years. Finally, God said, I've had it, trip canceled. <laughs> or something like that. The story says, they died in the desert, never got to the promised land. Which I think means two things. Indulge in this long enough, you get your future canceled. And I guess it also means even God himself can only take so much. <laughs> Here's the next one. Philosophy that helped change my life. It's not what happens that determines your life future. It's not what happens that determines your life future. It's what you do about what happens. All of us are in like a little sailboat. And it's not the blowing of the wind that determines your destination. It's the set of the sail. So jot this phrase down. It's one of the best to understand. Kids need to understand it. The same wind blows on us all. The same wind blows on us all. The wind of disaster, the wind of opportunity, the wind of change. The wind when it's upside down, the wind when it's favorable and unfavorable. The same wind blows on us all. The economic wind, the social wind, the political wind. The same wind blows on everybody. The difference in where you arrive in one year, three years, five years. The difference in arrival is not the blowing of the wind, but the set of the sail. And that's what learning is all about. To set a better sail this year than last year. To set a better sail. The first six years of my economic life, I wound up broke. Second six years, I wound up rich. You say, well, the Democrats must have finally gotten power. No, no, no. It was not a political change. Here's what changed the second six years of my economic life. It was my philosophy that changed. The set of the sale of better thinking, correcting the errors of the past and picking up new disciplines of the future. That's all I had to do at the end of the first six. Correct the errors of the past and then pick up some new disciplines for the future. And my total life changed. The second six years was totally different than the first six of my working life. And guess who can do that? Anybody. Now you can keep on the same path for the next couple of years as you have the past two. But if you wish to, if you wish to, then maybe everything's okay for you and you don't need to. But if you need to make some changes, I'm telling you, you can start doing it today so that the next two years will be drastically different than the last two. And anybody who wishes to do that can. And you can do it between ages 40 and 43. You can do it between ages 13 and 50. You can do it between ages 60 and 62. Any two years, any five years that you wish to drastically change from the previous five, you can do it. If you wish to. Now, this is not, this, this isn't written. This is not a law. Here's what it's called, opportunity. But if you don't know you can change, if you don't know, you can drastically change your income, change your future, change your health, change your marriage, change everything. If you don't know that, some people then go year after year after year after year not making much change simply because they, they didn't get to the class. They never read the book. They never went to the seminar. They never... And if we're around another 6,000 years, it's going to read like that, looks like, for the next 6,000 years. Opportunity mixed with difficulty. Now, sometimes there seems to be more opportunity than difficulty. And then sometimes there seems to be more difficulty than opportunity, but the mix isn't going to change. After expansion comes recession. But after recession comes expansion. Not to think so, see, is naive. And once you've got just a little of this stuff settled, then you know exactly what to do. You know exactly what to anticipate so you can be ready. Now, here's the next one, and I heard it in my invitation. Here's what it says. For things to change, you have to change. I was hoping the government would change and taxes would change and 
economics would change and my boss would change and be more generous. I wished for everything to change. And my teacher said, no, Mr. Owen, for things to change for you, you have to change. Don't wish it was easier, wish you were better. Once I understood this, this altered the course of my life. Don't wish it was easier, wish you were better. And here's the big one. Don't wish for less problems, wish for more skills. You don't need less problems. You simply need more skills. Don't wish for less challenge, wish for more wisdom. Accept the challenge, because you can't grow without a challenge. You can't get rich without a challenge. You can't fly without gravity. You have to understand the challenge. But that's the key, is to now develop wisdom to overcome the challenge. Don't wish for less challenge, but more wisdom. And then here's one more philosophy to help change my life forever. You can do the most remarkable things no matter what happens. Humans can do the most remarkable things no matter what happens. Philosophies that change my life. Time is precious. Life is not just the passing of time. Life is not just the passing of time. Life is a collection of experiences, their frequency and their intensity. Life is not just watching the clock tick away. Life is a collection of experiences, their intensity, their frequency. When my friend Mark died at age 44, someone says, that's young to die. But what if he lived four lifetimes in one? It might not be too young. Whatever the span of your life turns out to be, here's what you want to fill it up with, experiences and the intensity of those experiences. But now let's talk about the management of time. Now, jot this down, approaches to the management of time. Here's the first one, ignore the subject. I mean, that's good advice. Don't let anything overly bug you. Because remember now, you don't have to do anything. Someone says, well, I've got to get a handle on my time. And the answer is, no, you don't. If you want to let it all go, you can let it all go. I mean, this is good advice. Somebody says, you ought, you ought, you ought. Jot this down. Ignore all the you oughts or you should. Only if they're giving general information. We should. It's better to say if you're teaching, we should. Not you should. We should. Then you let me listen in without it being too confrontational. If everyone did this, see, that'd be great. And then you give a person a chance to choose to do it or not to do it. But when you start the you ought, you ought, now see if I don't, now see we've got some tension and maybe some problems. So you ought seem to always create problems. Because this is personal dignity. And you don't want to destroy someone's dignity by doing all the oughts and they feel reluctant to do it. Now we've got problems. So if you want to, just ignore this subject on time management. Now, here's the next one. Step down to something easier. The guy's in sales and he says, oh, I want to own the company. Finally owns the company. Now he's got no time to play golf. He said, when I was in sales, I was making big money playing golf three days a week. Heck with this owning something. Heck with managing. My life was never my own after I started to manage. I'm going back to sales. See, this is the key. If you're getting too pressed, you might consider stepping down to something with a little easier time pressure. Little girl says to her mother, Daddy comes home, brings his briefcase and pats me on the head and says hello, disappears and works on his papers. How come my daddy doesn't play with me? And her mother said, look, your daddy loves you very much, but he's so busy at work, he can't get it all done, he has to bring it home. He loves you, but that's why he can't play with you. And the little girl said, why don't they just put him in a slower group? <laughs> so... Jot this down now. If you don't have time for your kids, you might consider joining a slower group. Remember when I said some things I went for cost me too much? So reconsider. Next key to time management. And that's work longer and harder. But see, there's a limit to that. I almost lost my health the first year. I went so crazy about personal development and achievement. I just went bonkers. You know, I told you I was skinny, but at the end of that first year, I was a walking shadow. 
And then it suddenly occurred to me, what if I got rich and too ill to spend it? I mean, that was a shocker. So I started developing a little more reasonable because I said, if 12 hours won't do it, I'll work 14. If that won't do it, I'll work 18. I mean, how many hours it takes. And sure enough, it cost me too much. So see, working longer and harder for some might be appropriate. You know, if you're just sitting around not doing that much, this might be good, work longer and harder. But you can only work so hard. Here's the key, not to work harder, but smarter. When you've worked as hard as you can, doing the best you can in terms of physical output in the time, reasonable time. Now, here's the ultimate in the management of time, and that is you simply become more skillful. When I first got into sales, you know, I was around people that could get, you know, nine out of ten, eight out of ten. And when I first started, I could only get one out of ten. But here's what I did. I worked around the clock, around the clock, so that I would make up in numbers what I lacked in skill. That's good in sales. You got to jot that down. When you're new, you make up in numbers what you lack in skill. Now, when you become more skillful, the numbers can go down because now your persuasive ability and all of that is now so high that you don't need to put as many numbers out. But at first, if you want to compete or if you want to really get good, you've got to put in the numbers. But if you get more from yourself, develop more of yourself, now the time management becomes an easier task. Now, here's the next thing. Either you run the project or it runs you. I've found out when you start something, at first you're in charge. All of a sudden, a year later, it's in charge. Some of the companies I started, I'm telling you, I'm in control. A couple of years later, I'm out of control. At first, I've got it on the run. Two years later, it's got me on the run. Haven't got enough time. I'm dizzy with trying to get it all done. So here's part of the key, and that's to get in charge. It's easy to start something. First thing you know, you're out of control. It's in control. The enterprise you get started now runs you ragged. Because I did that when I had the whole 13 offices and the big entourage. I'm telling you, it was like short nights and long days and just sort of the never-ceasing demand for time and activity, which was fine. At that time in my life, it was fine and created a lot of good results and laid some good foundation for a lot of future careers that came from those unique times. It was a pretty long list of people who were inspired by it and educated by it and participated in that program I had going. But then I rechanged the format to sort of rearrange my own life personally, which has paid off for me. Now I have a heavy workload, but if you finally get to the place where you have most everything done for you, I still farm in Idaho, but I'm what's known as a gentleman farmer. A gentleman farmer gives orders and other people do the work. It's different than being a farmer doing the work yourself. I know that because I was raised in the farm country where I still have my farm, but now I have the luxury of participants who look after my agriculture, look after my home building, my daughter looks after all of my accounts and my residences and my real estate, and I have good partners in business. That's extra luxury, where you can do your specialty and other people working make it valuable. Of all the subjects we've covered so far and are about to cover, none is more important than covering the disciplines for success. What's at the core of achieving the good life? The major key to the good life. The major key is not in learning how to set goals. It is not in learning how to better manage your time. It is not in mastering the attributes of leadership. Every day in a thousand different ways, we are trying to improve ourselves by learning how to do things. We spend a lifetime gathering knowledge in classrooms, in textbooks, in experiences. Now, if knowledge is power, if knowledge is the forerunner to success, then why do we fall short of our objectives? Why, in spite of all our knowledge and in spite of our collective experiences, do we find ourselves aimlessly wandering? settling for a life of existence rather than a life of substance. 
There may be many answers to this question. Your answers may be different than your associates or your spouses or your friends. While there may be many answers to this question, the fundamental answer is the absence of discipline. Applying all that we know. That's the key word, discipline, self-discipline. We might add one more word here, consistent. Consistent self-discipline. It doesn't really matter how smart you are or how much you know if you don't use it. It doesn't really matter that you graduated magna cum laude if you're stuck in a low-paying job. It doesn't really matter if you attended every seminar that comes to town if you don't apply what you've learned. Better than knowledge is applied knowledge. And once we've applied our knowledge, we must study the results of that process. Apply our knowledge, study the results. Refine our approach. Finally, by trying and observing and refining and trying again, our knowledge will inevitably produce worthy results, admirable results. And with the joy and results of our efforts, we continue to apply, to learn, to observe, to fuel our ambition with the positive reinforcement of continued progress. Pretty soon, we'll find that we're swept into a spiral of achievement, a vertical rise to success. And the ecstasy of that total experience makes for a life of triumph over tragedy, dullness, and mediocrity. But for this whole process to work for us, we must first master the art of discipline, self-discipline, consistent self-discipline. It takes consistent self-discipline to master the art of setting goals, to master the art of time management, to master the art of leadership, to master the art of parenting and relationships. If we don't make consistent self-discipline part of our daily lives, the results we seek will be sporadic and elusive. It takes a consistent effort to truly manage our valuable time, or we'll be consistently frustrated. Our time will be eaten up by others whose demands are stronger than our own. It takes discipline to conquer the nagging voices in our minds, the fear of failure, the fear of success, the fear of poverty, the fear of a broken heart. It takes discipline to keep trying when that nagging voice within us brings up the possibility of failure. It takes discipline to admit our errors and recognize our limitations. The voice of the human ego speaks to all of us. Sometimes the voice of ego says that we should magnify our value beyond our results. It leads us to exaggerate, to not be totally honest. It takes discipline to be totally honest, both with ourselves and with others. Be certain of one thing. Every exaggeration of the truth, once detected by others, destroys our credibility and makes all that we say and do suspect. As soon as a business colleague figures out that we tend to exaggerate, guess what? They'll always think we exaggerate, and they'll never quite hold us in the same regard again. The tendency to exaggerate, distort, or even withhold the truth is an inherent part of all of us. And only an all-out disciplined assault can overcome this tendency. It takes discipline to change a habit, because habits are formed a little bit each day, every day, every day. Once habits are formed, they act like a giant cable. They act like a nearly unbreakable instinct that only long-term disciplined activity can change. We must unweave every strand of the cable of habits slowly and methodically until the cable that once held us in bondage becomes nothing more than scattered strands of wire. It takes the consistent application of a new discipline, a more desirable one to overcome one which is less desirable. It takes discipline to plan. It takes discipline to execute our plan. It takes discipline to look with full objectivity at the results of our applied plan. And it takes discipline to change either our plan or our method of executing that plan if the results are poor. It takes discipline to be firm, when the world throws opinions at our feet. It takes discipline to ponder the value of someone else's opinion when our pride and our arrogance leads us to believe that we are the only ones with the answers. Discipline is a constant human awareness of the need for action and a conscious act by us to implement that action. 
Discipline is an awareness of the constant need for action and a conscious act to implement that action. If our awareness and our implementations occur at the same time, then we begin a valued sequence of disciplined activity. Now here's the other side of discipline. If there's considerable time that passes between the moment of awareness and the time of our implementation, then that is called procrastination. Doing it tomorrow instead of today. Procrastination, an almost exact opposite of discipline. The voice within us says, get it done. Discipline then says, do it now. Do it to the best of your ability, today, tomorrow, and always, until finally, the worthy deed becomes instinctive. Procrastination says later, tomorrow, whenever I get a chance. Procrastination also says, do what is necessary to get by or to impress others. Do what you can, but not what you must. In every circumstance we face, we are constantly presented with these two choices. Do it now or do it later. Discipline and procrastination. A choice between a disciplined existence bearing the fruit of achievement and contentment or procrastination, the easy life for which the future will bear no fruit, only the bare branches of mediocrity. The rewards of a disciplined life are great, but they're often delayed until some time in the future. The rewards for the lack of discipline are immediate, but they are minor in comparison to the immeasurable rewards of consistent self-discipline. An immediate reward for lack of discipline is a fun day at the beach. A future reward of discipline is owning the beach. For most, we choose today's pleasure rather than tomorrow's fortune. So how can you get rid of the easy distractions? How can you keep your mind on what you're trying to do? How can you keep an attitude of doing it all and doing it now? How can you make the choice of discipline over procrastination? How can you stay focused on your ambitions? How can you avoid conversations at the water cooler? You can keep your focus on your work. You can get it done today instead of tomorrow. You've got to really work on your consistent self-discipline on a daily basis, or you'll find yourself distracted. Distracted by negative thoughts, distracted by negative people, distracted by water cooler chatter, and pretty soon, depending on the type of people you've associated with, distracted by your doubts within yourself. Never underestimate the power of influence and associations, and never underestimate the power of your own consistent self-discipline. Now let's take a closer look at discipline. True discipline is not the easiest option. Most people would rather sleep until 10 o'clock than get up at 6. It's easier to go to bed late sleep late, show up late, leave early. It's easier not to read. It's easier to turn on the television than to open a book. It's easier to do just enough than to do it all. Waiting is always easier than acting. Trying is always easier than doing. Imagine what life would be like if we didn't have to make our bed in the morning or keep our garage clean or pay our taxes or show up for work tomorrow. Wouldn't it be fascinating if we didn't have to do these things, wouldn't it be fascinating? What do you suppose would become of us? You're right, not much. For whatever the reason, the system we live in and contribute to is designed to make the easiest things in life the most unprofitable. Profitable seems to be the most difficult. Our world is and always will be a constant battle between the life of ease and its momentary rewards and a life of discipline and its far more significant rewards. Each has its own price, the price of discipline or the price of regret. We will pay one or the other. What we wish we had done is the voice of regret, speaking in a sorrowful tone at a time when there is no going back. This is regret. No second chance. No, what would I do differently? Choose one or the other but both will have their price, the price of discipline or the price of regret. One costs pennies, the other a fortune. Dostoevsky said, there are hundreds of young men who would die for the truth, but very few who would spend five years studying to know what the truth is.
whatever it takes to get you to try harder, read more, set your goals and go for it. Here's the next attitude disease. Over caution. Some people never will have much. They're too cautious. Now, you can also be too reckless, but you can also be too cautious. This is called the timid approach to life. And my caution was always the risk. Risk used to drive me right up the wall. I used to say, what if this happens? It's called the language of the poor. What if this happens? And on top of that, if this was to happen, look at the fix I'd be in. I better not try. I could always ace myself out. Then I'll tell you what changed my whole life when I finally discovered it's all risky. The minute you were born, it got risky. If you think trying is risky, wait till they hand you the bill for not trying. If you think investing is risky, wait till you get the tab for not investing. See, it's all risky. Getting married is risky. Having children is risky. Going into business is risky. Investing your money is risky. It's all risky. I'll tell you how risky life is. You're not gonna get out alive. <laughs> that's risky. The Englishman says, well, if that's the way it's gonna work out, let's give it a go. Right, that's what it's for. Give it a go. Somebody says, yeah, but I'm looking for safety and security. Fine, then huddle in a corner. We'll cover you with a sheet, bring you three meals a day. And we'll protect you, feed you, look after you, care for you. We won't let anything happen to you. And you'll probably live to be 100. The guy said, well, yeah, I'd live to be 100. But what a way to live. Right. What a way to live safe and secure. Don't ask for security. Ask for adventure. Better to live 30 years full of adventure than 100 years safe in the corner. And see, it's not important how long you live. What's important is how you live. Here's the next attitude disease. We're almost through with this motley list. In fact, we're almost through. Hang on. The next one is pessimism. Pessimism, the deadly disease of always looking on the bad side, the problem side, the difficult side, checking all the reasons why it can't be done. The poor pessimist leads an ugly life. He doesn't try to figure out what's right. He tries to figure out what's wrong. He doesn't look for virtue. He looks for faults. And when he finds them, he's delighted. How ugly. This is the poor guy looks through the window, doesn't see the sunset. He sees the specks on the window. <laughs> and this is the poor guy, right, who rushes up, takes such leave of his senses. This guy rushes up and he says, I've got five good reasons why it won't work. He's so dumb, he doesn't know. All he needs one. He's got five. <laughs> To the pessimist, the glass is always half empty. To the optimist, the glass is half full. Why would the same measure affect people two different ways? Answer, it all depends on how you look at it. Our lives are mostly affected by the way we think things are, not the way they are. The way we think they are affects us most. There's a subject we don't have time to get into tonight called better thinking habits. One of the major things Shove taught me when I met him, he said, poor thinking habits keeps most people poor. Not poor working habits. Most people work hard, but they don't think hard. And Shove taught me that the mind is like a factory, a mental factory. And whatever you think about all day long pours ingredients into this mental factory. And that's what builds the economic, social, financial fabric of your life. He quoted me a Bible phrase that says, as you think, so you become. How awesome. 
When he talked about poor thinking habits, he had me. I used to start the day reading the morning newspaper. I mean, you can believe that or not. I'd get a cup of coffee and read the paper. I'd load up on wars and riots and murders and stabbings and killings and bank robberies and muggings and car wrecks and tragedies. I'd even read the back pages. I seem to like that stuff for some weird reason. I'd load up on all that and then I'd start the day. You can imagine the kind of days I used to have. You walk around on your financial knees. They call you economic peewee. The guy says, I want to be a great leader. Wonderful. The first thing we do is follow him to his house. When we get there, we walk in and check his library, number one. Somebody says, well, why check his library? The reason is because what a man reads pours massive ingredients into his mental factory and the fabric of his life is built from those ingredients. You would not believe what some people have got in their house to read. You would not believe. One of the best dressed up words I know for a lot of it is trash. Can you imagine dumping a barrel of trash into this mental factory every day and coming out with a rich, dynamic, positive life? It can't be done. You might as well try making a cake with cement. The kids back in Danbury, Connecticut, high school, they're asking me questions one day. I'm talking to the kids. Kids got good questions these days. One of them said to me, Mr. Rohn, how do you build the good life? I said, it's simple. It's not easy, but it's simple. Here's how you build anything. Select the right ingredients, keep out the wrong ingredients, and it starts with thought. Everything starts with thought. So you must be wise and careful what you think about because that starts everything. You got to be wise and careful. I asked the kids, what would happen if somebody dropped sugar in my coffee? They said, well, you'd be okay. I said, what if somebody dropped strychnine in my coffee? They said, well, you'd be dead. I said, correct. Lesson one, life is both sugar and strychnine. You gotta be careful. I said, what if my worst enemy drops in the sugar? They said, will you be okay? I said, what if my best friend, even by accident, drops in the strychnine? They said, well, you'd be dead. I said, correct. Lesson two, watch your coffee. <laughs> You gotta be careful. See, it doesn't matter who hands you the bad stuff. It doesn't matter where you get the bad stuff. It'll still do its damage on your bank account. Wherever you get it. Mr. Schoff gave me one of the greatest phrases when I first met him when he said, Jim, every day stand guard at the door of your mind. How important. Stand guard at the door of your mind. And you decide what goes into your mental factory. Don't let anybody just dump anything they want to in your mental factory, because you've got to live with the results. Okay, here's the last disease, and we're through with this list. In fact, we're almost through. Hang on. The last subject is very brief. The last disease, but this one is deadly. Engage in this one, indulge in it even slightly, and you might as well forget the future because it's going to forget you. Complaining, crying, whining, griping, a Bible word called murmuring. See, that'll ace your future. Spend five minutes complaining, and you have wasted five. And you may have begun what's known as economic cancer of the bone. Surely they will soon haul you off into a financial desert and there let you choke on the dust of your own regret. I hope I said that well, so you won't forget. It's a deadly disease. If you don't think it's bad, 
Ask the Children of Israel of Old Testament fame. Typical of us all, their story just happened to get in the book. Story says, children of Israel were slaves. God performed a series of dazzling miracles and got them out. And now they're heading for the promised land. Remember the story? Heading for the promised land. Tragedy of the story, they never got there. Reason, from day one, they started to complain. They griped about the water. They griped about the weather. They whined and cried and griped about the food. They griped about the leadership. They whined and cried because it was too far, too cold, too hot, too difficult, too miserable. I mean, they whined and, whined and cried for years. Finally, God said, I've had it, trip canceled. <laughs> or something like that. The story says they died in the desert, never got to the promised land. Which I think means two things. Indulge in this long enough, you get your future canceled. And I guess it also means even God himself can only take so much. Just be on the lookout of the things that can destroy all the good you start. The war is on. And this evening, tomorrow, mentally, personally, socially, economically, you got to make sure you're winning the war. And this is part of it.